The year is 526 ADD, five millennia since what was commonly known as the apocalypse. Years of pollution led to the destruction of the ozone layer. The radiation from the sun, coupled with the fallout from nuclear wars, created rapidly intense weather systems, leading to drastic flora, fauna, and geographical changes. A terrifying earthquake at the center of what was once the United States of America separates the east and west coast. The west is now a hybrid desert, forest, and jungle. The east is covered in ice. The island city, formerly known as New York, is the only habitable location. Eventually, society rose again and currently appears as a mixture of 15th century feudalism, 1980s technology, and early 21st century attitudes. Presently, King Morton oversees the West, and Queen Polar Vortex the East. Both rule their subjects with an iron fist. Anything that does not directly serve the needs of the royals is forbidden. With the creation of all entertainment, the highest offense, and punishable by death. Francisco splashed the scalding hot water on his face, then wiped his hand across the foggy bathroom mirror, and nothing. No burning, no pain. Most water of the 5th century had an acidic tinge to it that offered first-degree burns, but the Prince of the West felt nothing. He smacked himself across the face for what had to be the 18th time. Still, there was nothing. He had to use his left arm, having broken in his right, flinging himself down the stairs in another failed attempt to feel something. The Prince reflected over all of his facial scars. The cuts from when he bashed his skull into his car's windshield. The black right eye from when Delphine smashed his face in with a frying pan, post-proclamation that she was having an affair. If Sisko had to guess, that simultaneous emotional blow to the heart and the very real blow to his cranium is what caused this radical numbing. The pan slap, stair trip, and now, bathroom freakout happened over a full 24-hour period of time. But the events that created them had been brewing for over a year since Sisko's cousin, slash half-brother Prince Bachner, a.k.a. Bushy, came to him with a proposition. The two of them were in the Royal Bistro, about to use a blindfolded delivery boy as target practice. The driver's crime was being ten minutes late with their pizza. Bushy sighed, tapping Sisko on the shoulder before he was about to use his mini-hand submachine gun to shoot a fatal micro-torpedo into the delivery boy's forehead. Stall it out, Sisko. I'm over it. You sure? I'm yawning, brah. So don't end him then? Don't. And give him a really big tip or something. Francisco saw the delivery boy out, throwing a wad of paper money at the boy's forehead before he reached his car. Glad that wasn't a torpedo, huh? Bushy was having a drink at the patio bar. He could see his brother-slash-cousin sauntering over to him. Everyone in the kingdom hated Sisko, but Bushy pitied him, and a small 2% of what you could call a conscience almost felt guilty about the scam he was going to approach him with. Francisco plopped next to Bushy, put his drink order into the nearby automated bartender, and watched as turbo whiskey filled into a pint-sized glass. Don't tell me you're getting soft! Bushy hated that Francisco mostly spoke in questions. It put all of the work in any conversation completely on your shoulders. This life is boring. We wake up, we party, we kill scrubs. Pfft, I'm 30 years old, and I got nothing to show for it. Yeah, that sucks! But I got an idea, bruh. You know, Vesper, that girl you and Delphi hooked me up with? Sure. We got a wild idea, and we just need some of your ends to make it work. What's the idea? We're going to make a movie. The art of filmmaking had become a crime since the content wars of 376 ADD. Anyone involved with the creation, distribution, and or viewing of any expression of art displaying a coherent narrative, characters, and or plot would be sentenced to death. Francisco knew this, but he also knew that Bushy was the smartest person he knew. 
Everyone told him that, including his father and his fiance. So the idea of his brother slash cousin having a bad plan that could surely lead to their deaths was behind a fleet of afterthoughts. How much you need? For the next three months, Francisco gave Bushy over 80000 in funds. During the filmmaking process, Francisco carried out his usual routine of sleep, intoxication, and casual homicide. Occasionally, he went shopping, which is where he got the bright orange ascot he wore day in and day out until it became grimy and worn. Not once did he ever check on the movie or his fiancée Delphine, who he allowed to be the leading lady. The idea of her using this opportunity to have an affair with her co-star was another afterthought buried behind so many others. Signor, aka Sig, was a dog skull mutant. A great Danester to be exact. He had the head of an animal, but the body of a normal man. Part of the next evolution that had been taking place since 108 ADD. The dog skulls were feared and subjugated by mankind. But these days they held positions of power in the service industries. Sig was a waiter at his Uncle Vern's diner, where he encountered Bushy, the king's bastard, who was robbing the diner for no reason other than boredom. The two hit it off, which is to be expected when one of the parties in a conversation is holding a deadly micro-sized bazooka up the nostril of the other. After taking in the fear and desperation on Sig's face, Bushy put his weapon into his magnetic holster, easing down into the red-leathered booth without taking his eyes off the dog skull in front of him. You gotta look, my friend. Has anyone ever told you that? Sig's hands were still in the air as he moved his head from side to side. Calm down, Papa Squat, young pup. This is the seventh place I've stuck up tonight. Going on a bit of a rampage, if you can't tell. I'm in the middle of casting and I can't seem to find what I want. Sig nodded, despite having no idea what he was saying. What's your name, boy? Uh, Alfonso Aloysius Brando Conductible Signor. But people call me Sig. Pleased to meet you, Sig. I'm Bushy. You're on the paper money. Five spot, to be exact. But it's not good to interrupt. Anywho, have you ever thought about being in a motion picture? No, never, my lord. The truth was, Sig had heard about and been in awe of the mythical warriors called actors since he was a pup. He marveled at their ability to lie to get to the truth, though he wasn't going to admit any of that to the guy on the $5 bill just so he could get his head blown off. Sig hated his dog skull, but not nearly enough to part ways with it. Bushy stared him down until a smile emerged, and he burst out laughing. Ha 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 ha! That was fantastic! The fear! The sincerity! I can tell you were lying, but you still sold me! Simply amazing! Sir, if you're going to kill me, please do it now, because I really don't want to die of this stroke that's about to happen. My apologies, you're not going to die. In fact, hold on. You got any surveillance cameras in here? Sig pointed at the two cameras to the right and left corners of the ceiling. Bushy took out his pocket bazooka and shot one camera after the other before turning back to Sig. I'm gonna make you a star, my furry friend. A day later, Sig found himself on the movie set. Not knowing what to expect, it just seemed like a bunch of people hanging out on a street corner. Everyone else was 100% human, as expected, but they were of the new youth, so they feigned their overly enthusiastic support of Sig expressing cheers of soon your people will rise and I wish I was a dog skull I hate being a sapien. He laughed to himself knowing that they were the exact kinds of people Uncle Vern favored to use in his mystery stew, a culinary delicacy of the West. Backstage Sig smiled and nodded politely amongst the phonies until he saw Delphine. She was ghostly white, tall, real thin, a purple dress clung to her hips, with red pouty lips and a mop top of even more vibrant, fiery hair. He approached her. Hello, Mom. I'm... Wow, waitstaff. Cisco is certainly blowing his load into this thing. I'll have a... No, Mom. I'm Sieg. I'm the lead actor. Jeez Louise. Vesper told me she got a dog skull boy for the lead. 
but I thought she was joking. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Duchess Delphine, and your co-star. I don't blame you for gawking, but I must warn you that I am sleeping with the producer. She gestured to the tall, blonde, muscular man with the dingy orange ascot, who just slapped a cup of coffee out of the hands of a terrified personal assistant. Sig instantly recognized him as the guy on the $2 bill. The actual prince? The one and the same. Hold on to your tail, Scruffy. It's Sig. I don't care. We're going to my trailer. I'd love to. I wasn't asking. Now hurry that mangy hide of yours. From that moment on, and within minutes of being on set, Sig was in his first illustrious studio affair. Truthfully, Delphine had been on a self-destructive streak since she could breathe, and an affair with a half-breed on the set of an illegal film while well, she was engaged to the Prince of the West seemed to her like the type of chaos so good it should have come with a price tag. Originally, she was having an affair with Vesper, her handmaiden that she set up with Bushy at Francisco's request. But that relationship had gotten stale, as Vesper showed herself to be more concerned with this idiotic film than anything else these days. The plan was to make Vesper jealous, which in turn would make Francisco jealous. And then she could feed off all of the attention, as Delphine had as many cries for help as Francisco had afterthoughts. In truth, Vesper had caught on to Delphine's little game. She was content with her as the only reason she started their affair was to get close enough to the king's bastard slash nephew to help gain the funds to her film. Vesper grew up the daughter of underground makers whose guerrilla films were sold throughout the black market. When King Morton caught wind of this, he had her parents burned alive in the castle courtyard. Vesper spent the rest of her childhood hidden amongst the castle staff, cleaning bedrooms and toilets, slowly waiting for her moment to strike, toiling sleeplessly on her script for the perfect film. She found out that Prince Bachner had secretly been producing disposable snuff films, many movies of real murders that would self-destruct after they were played. Vesper took this opportunity to gain favor with Delphine, seduce her, and then convince the Duchess to introduce her to Bachner. Her pitch won him over. He agreed to finance her film of rebellion. From Bushy's perspective, this small mousy girl with the thick glasses and squeaky voice couldn't have come at a better time. He was looking to defect overseas, and the easiest way to do that would be if he had something to bargain. Like an illegally made anti-Western propaganda film, for instance. Things could not have gone more smoothly. The film had been made... Francisco had been so careless with his money that Bushy was able to pocket over a third of the budget. All he needed to do now was get from the West to his contact in Kansas City. He told Vesper, Cisco, Delphine, and Sig that a plane was waiting to take them all the way to the other side of the world. But once they got there, he would order them all to be shot on sight. Prince Francisco watched his father, King Morton, direct the royal mover as he took his collection of taxidermied kittens from their delivery crate to be organized on his new oak shelves. He called out to the frail assistant who stood by nervously, holding a frozen calico cat on the wobbly ladder adjacent to the 12-foot-tall shelf. Your collection finally got here, huh, Pops? Yes, and not a moment too soon. Look at it, son. Every cat species in the West hunted down to extinction by her own father. Every cat species? Every last one. Hell of a project, but it was worth it. What's next? I really want to move up to people. Take Pistachio here. Can't you just see a petrified version of him frozen in terror for all eternity? Standing right where you are. Wouldn't that be tough? Certainly. That's why I'm starting slow, using dog skulls as practice. There was word that one is starring in an illegal film that's making the rounds. So I've arranged for your cousin. Don't you mean brother cousin? To round him up. Sorry I hadn't told you earlier. You were healing from that incident on the stairs. How's the cast, by the way? I think it's fine, 
Dad, I gotta go, I think. But I love you, and it might be goodbye forever, you know? Oh, my little Francisco, you are quite the card. Carry on, and don't be late for supper. Francisco shrugged, picked up his suitcase, and jogged to the castle gates where everyone had been waiting in the royal van. Hours post-supper, neither of King Morton's sons had returned. There was no trace of their new dog skull friend, the Duchess, or her handmaiden. King Morton called the royal bureaucrat, who then did a little bit of digging to find out that his very own sons were responsible for the current illegal film and might just be leaving to Europe on a shipment liner expected to be in Kansas City by the end of the week. For reasons unknown to all, King Morton actually cared for his two sons and did not wish to see them harmed, even though the law of the land required their deaths for their involvement in the illegal film. He decided to dispatch the royal bounty hunter, who would retrieve his wayward sons and bring them back to the castle. The dog skull, the duchess, and her handmaiden would be executed. The thought of having not one, not two, but three new taxidermy subjects managed to turn his betrayed frown upside down. He looked forward to sharing a meal of mystery stew from his favorite restaurant with his boys as soon as they returned. You just listened to The Flannel Ronin, Episode 1, The Western Royals. This audio drama was written, performed, recorded, and edited by Drew Manning. If you enjoyed it, please stay tuned to this channel. Thank you for your time. Have a great one.